everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna be talking about sexual and reproductive healthcare restrictions in California's faith-based hospitals. California has recently declared itself as a sanctuary state for reproductive freedom and transgender rights. And this is in response to legislation restricting abortion access across the country. In 2021 alone, over 100 restrictions were enacted and 26 states are predicted to ban abortion in the case that Roe v. Wade is overturned. There's also a wave of legislation restricting gender affirming care for transgender youth. The restrictions are illustrated below. And this has been happening across over half of the US states and is predicted to impact a third of the country's transgender population. And this is important because gender affirming care is well recognized to improve mental health health outcomes, which are recognized to be poor for transgender students who face discrimination in school settings. The bar graph below shows how uh, access to gender affirming surgery decreases the presence of anxiety disorders and the rate of suicide attempts in transgender youth. In order to protect sexual and reproductive health care access, California has introduced a number of bills this year um, aimed at protecting privacy, expanding the workforce, um, decreasing costs, and protecting out-of-state people who are seeking access to comprehensive health care. This leads to the question, are there additional barriers to accessing evidence-based sexual and reproductive health care? One barrier is the presence of faith-based hospitals, where scientific standards can be superseded by religious standards during medical decisions. An example of that is the Catholic healthcare system, which is the most prominent religiously affiliated system in the U.S. and is controlled by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops who determine which services are and are not available. This is a quote where they are disaffirming, um, disavowing gender affirming care for transgender youth um, contrary to the scientific evidence. Faith-based hospitals do not provide healthcare services deemed to be, quote, intrinsically immoral. Beyond gender affirming care, this includes assisted reproductive technology, which is a primary way in which same-sex couples can conceive, sterilization, contraception, abortion, including to treat miscarriage, and in instances of incest or rape. The graph on the right shows the percent of hospital beds owned by the Catholic Church across the U.S. The number is one in six across the country and in California. While the presence of faith-based hospitals themselves are not an issue, the lack of informed consumer choice is. This is based on insurance coverage, geographical limitations, awareness, and resources necessary to achieve to access those health cares. In order to better understand the presence of faith-based hospital beds in California, us at the Science Policy Group created this heat map to show that the distribution of the faith-based hospitals and the cost borne by the people in these counties is not evenly distributed. A closer look shows the percent of religiously affiliated acute care hospital beds across 24, 20 California counties. As you can see, five counties have exclusively religiously affiliated um, hospital beds and the presence is quite high across all 20. Another barrier to access is awareness. In a nationwide poll of women whose primary healthcare provider was a Catholic institution, over a third of them were not aware of that religious affiliation. Another nationwide survey found that less than 3% of Catholic hospitals listed the services they did not offer due to religious affiliation on their hospital, and all of these were in Washington. And that is based on a mandate that Washington passed as a law recently. So based on that, I have two policy proposals. First, to mandate that hospitals state any religious affiliation clearly on their website homepage and explicitly mention which, office, which services are not offered. The second is to create a data, database listing based based restrictions on sexual and reproductive health care so people can know where and where they cannot access. This is important now because the presence of faith based hospitals is growing due to increasing buying power from mergers and partnerships. The percent shown here in this graph of acute care hospital beds that are religiously affiliated in 20 California counties that we analyzed shows that it was quite stable for the first decade of the 2000s and has dramatically increased since then. Dignity Health is the largest provider of Medi-Cal in California and is a Catholic system, and they have just merged with Catholic Health Initiatives to become the largest hospital system in the country. Um, that's all, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Yuki. We'll now move to questions.
Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, you, you have a good model, a good kind of, kind of problem, a good model um, from Washington, but how would this be enforced? That's a good question. So that's how we have the two pronged. So for example, with Washington, how there was a mandate to stay on the website, that there was an affiliation, they were actually finding that there was a big trouble actually enforcing that. A lot of them weren't doing that, which is why that we wanted to propose having a website that the government itself makes with all the counties, all the hospitals are available, whether or not they have that affiliation and what that means for the services that are offered. And part of the reason we came up with that is because when we were trying to create that heat map, there was actually a lot of cross-checking that we had to do to even find the hospitals were religiously affiliated, figure out, there was a lot of emailing back and forth, even with these hospitals to figure out what services they offer. Um, and a lot of them, as I showed in the graph, were recently bought. Um, so a lot of other databases weren't even updated. Do you know if, I mean, so could you find out what, what they didn't provide? I mean, like reproductive, uh, services and those kinds of things. I mean, how how difficult was that? I mean, I, I so difficult. Yeah, I didn't know they they were they were that big. And why, how did they grow? Sorry, you got me very curious. You're getting a five on curiosity. I now want to know a lot more about this. Sorry. Yeah, it's a really it's a really prevalent issue that isn't covered a whole lot. Um, it was it was really really challenging. And when we publish this, we're going to have a really detailed methods section um, because it, there isn't one clear database that we go to pull this information. Um, yeah, in terms of the emails, so someone on our team was emailing pretty much every single hospital and they only got a response from one person that said that they wanted to talk over the phone. But a lot of the websites will say things like, we support the LGBTQ community, um, which is you know, great as part of their mission statement, but then they don't say, but these are the services that are relevant to you that we will withhold. And do they, is there a state way, I mean, we can't interfere with you know, practice of faith in you know, First Amendment, um, but is there a way to use state funding to, as incentives to you know, encourage greater offering of these services? Do these hospitals get state funding? Yeah, they get, they get. So yeah, for example, like I mentioned, Dignity Health um, is the biggest uh, medical provider. So because um, of the, those kind of services, they do actually get a lot of government aid, um, which has actually fueled their ability to have that increased buying power and continue merging and become a more powerful system. Wow. Okay. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you again, Yuki. I want to go on, but <laughs> thank you. Um, next up, we have Stephanie. Um, Stephanie 